Back when uh, our, our Kara was little, uh, she was part of a, um, I think either it was a kindergarten or maybe a, a Mother's Day Out program where she was asked to draw pictures of her family. And so uh, this is her picture of Kara that she drew of herself. Uh, notice the curly hair, that, that's Kara. And then next she drew a picture of Keone. Keone's my second daughter. Keone knows the, the straight hair that she has. Then she drew a picture of Christine, her mom, or my wife. And back then, Christine had short hair. And then this is a picture of me. Dad <laughs> had five hairs. She was very generous then. Now, if she had uh, drawn this recently, uh, I would have been pretty upset, OK? <laughs> but uh, this was when she was four or five, so that, obviously that, that is her uh, perception of, of how we looked. And we can uh, take the next slide down there. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, now, if we were to ask you to draw a picture of God, what would you draw? Could you draw a picture of God? <laughs> there was a child in a Sunday school class who was drawing a picture. And when she was asked what she was drawing, she replied, I'm drawing God. And the teacher says, nobody can draw a picture of God. No, no one knows what God looks like. And the child goes, they will when I get done. <laughs> but seriously, it's, it's impossible to draw a picture of God, because although you might be able to draw the Son, Jesus Christ, because he was actually here on earth for a few years, you would be omitting God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. You know, we believe in a triune God. We just sang about this earlier. You know, God is three persons, three in one. Uh, three persons but one God. And this is very confusing to a lot of people. Most people have a hard time wrapping their minds around what this is, Trinity is. But God has given us something that can help us visualize and understand his triune nature and his essence. And what has he given us? Well, the institution of marriage. Marriage. The relationship between the husband and wife can be a great picture to help us understand this triune God that we worship. And not only can it help us appreciate God more, but it can also help us in our relationships within our families. However, in order for this picture to work well, we have to live out marriage and understand marriage according to God's design. So this morning, we're going to take a look at how has God designed marriage to operate and work and see what we can learn through this. So let's all turn to Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. We're looking at verses 18 to 21 today. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers will let you borrow a Bible uh, from the church. Uh, we're on page 984 in the church Bible of Colossians. And we're only going to be taking a look at verses 18 to 19. Now, I was going to go through the off, uh, all four verses, but then there's just too much to, to say about them. So we're only going to take care of uh, husbands and wives this morning, and then next Sunday we'll talk about parents and, and children. Um, but if you've been here with us, we've been going through the book of Colossians these past few months, and we just took a two-week break because of Easter and because we had a guest speaker last week. But we're back. We're back. And a quick review of this chapter of chapter 3 it's about setting our hearts and our minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. And we sang about this. Gloria talked about that as she was sharing about uh, one of the songs we were singing about perspective. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to have an eternal perspective, to set our hearts and our minds on things above. And so in order to do that, we have to put to death certain sins, uh, sins that offend God, uh, and take off sins against one another. Uh, these are things that harm relationships. And then we are put on virtues, Christ-like characters that keep disagreements from becoming conflicts. And then verse 15 tells us to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ rule in your hearts, that we do everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, for many of us, this is not so hard to do at church, okay? Because we only see each other once a week, maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week if you're really involved. You see each other, and you don't have to see everybody all the time. You see one or two people or, or you know, just a couple people in your fellowship group. Um, so it's not so hard to be at peace with people here at church. And you might even be able to do this at work at, or school. You know, you see people, but, you know, you're there for maybe eight hours. But, you know, if you don't like somebody, you can always leave them alone and just stay away from them or work with other people. Uh, so, so it's easier to do this at, 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 at your workplace or at school. But where is the hardest place for peace to rule? It's your home. It's your home. Because um, the family members, you know, it's the, the nicest angels at church 
can become demons and devils at home. And this is both true for children and adults, okay? We can change completely the way we are at home. So Paul literally brings the application home in these, two, in these three, four verses, literally. And he gives us rules on how to have the peace of Christ rule in your home. So today we'll be taking a look at the marriage relationship, like I said, and we'll see that the, these rules not only bring about peace in the home, but they're also reflective of the nature and the essence of God. And it helps us understand him more as we live these out. So whether you're married or not, I hope this deepens your appreciation and your understanding of God. And for those of you who are married, I pray, I hope that you can evaluate and see how are you doing in living out these roles. And if you're single and you hope to get married someday, maybe make sure that you base your understanding on marriage on God's word and not what the world tells you. Now, I'll admit, you know, today's subject is, is a little tough to talk about. Uh, it can easily make people get a little bit upset. Uh, but my calling as a pastor and preacher is to explain all of the word of God to you as best as I can. So, so please hear me out. It's okay if you don't agree. Uh, but you'll have to at least wrestle with the text to determine what is God saying through these words. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you again for your word, and I pray for you to speak to each and every one of us, no matter where we are in our faith, uh, that we would hear from you, and that you would reveal something to us that we can live out this week. And so just fill me with your spirit so that your word is taught, not mine. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, here we go. Verse 18 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So this first command to the wives is to submit to their husbands. Now, this is a very, very controversial command, especially in today's society. Uh, with all this talk about equal rights and things like that, this has become a very unpopular passage in the Bible. Uh, both men and women have abused these passages to no end. Okay, It's been used to justify verbal and physical abuse as well as passivity and, 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 and self-suppression and non-involvement. But really, it's important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to know what does this really mean, okay? First, it's important to know what submission is not. This is not what God is saying through his word. It does not mean inferiority, okay? This command does not mean that men are better or superior to women or that women are inferior to men. In fact, that's very clear throughout Scripture, Genesis 1, 26 to 27, uh, in, the Genesis, in, in the creation account, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. So both men and women are created in the image of God. They are both image bearers of God. Galatians 3.28 tells us this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is nor male or and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we are all, again, equal in Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that men and women are the same, okay? They are different, and they are to live out these differences in the church and in the family. But the context of this passage is salvation, okay? Anyone can be saved. There's no inferiority anywhere. Everyone has equal access to God. Everyone is equal in terms of intrinsic worth and value to God. Okay, so submission does not mean inferiority. It does not mean being a doormat. It does not mean that the wife is a slave to her husband. It doesn't mean that the wife cannot disagree or that she cannot hold a different opinion or that she cannot speak up and speak her mind. So then what is submission? Well, the word in the original language means to place oneself under or to line up behind. Okay, to place oneself under or to line up behind. And in the original language, it's said in such a way that it's something that someone does to oneself. In other words, it's voluntary. It's a willing decision. Okay, so I don't really like the word wives submit to your husbands, the word submit being used in this passage because that just denotes outward conformity. Okay, you can actually force people to submit. But being submissive, okay, that emphasizes an attitude that comes from within. It's, it's voluntary. It's, it's willing. I choose 
to line up behind you is what this means. So that's the first point, is wives are to voluntarily line up behind their husbands, okay? So that means that you defer to his leadership in the home. So when there's disagreement, you express your opinions, you can express your desires respectfully, but then you defer to the husband's decision and you support it. When Christina and I were about to get married, we went through premarital counseling and we heard a, we were supposed to listen, we were supposed to listen to a series of tapes by Tim Keller, who is the pastor of Redeem, who at the time was a pastor of Redeemer, a Presbyterian church in New York. And he explained this best. He basically said that this means that the husband gets the tie-breaking vote. The husband gets the tie-breaking vote. I, I know I joked a few weeks ago that in Christine and my marriage, you know, there's a lot of compromise. Sometimes she gets her way, sometimes I get her way. Uh, but that's, you know, that, but seriously, when, when the husband gets the tie-breaking vote, okay, that doesn't mean he always gets his way. It means that after discussion and after hearing each other out, if they're still at an impasse, that the husband will get the tie-breaking vote. It means that she willingly defers and lines up behind his decision. And when that decision is made, she supports it and does her best to make it work. She doesn't look for the I told you so moment, but she hopes that it works out. Uh, in my wife, Christine, in my marriage, uh, we disagree on things from time to time, whether it be about finances or whether it be about you know, issues about child rearing or church issues and things like that. And we talk it out and we usually come to an agreement. But that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, and sometimes we're at an impasse and we have to make a decision. And she would say to me, okay, let me know what you decide. And she's not like, let me know what you decide. It was like, okay, we've talked it out. Let me know what you decide. And that's what we'll do. And that's her way of saying that she's deferring to my leadership and that I get the tie-breaking vote. And, and sometimes, you know, I decide her way. I say, okay, we'll go to Chipotle. No, no, I'm not. But on much more significant issues than that, sometimes we'll say, okay, I, after thinking this through, we'll go your way. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, this word submission is different from obey, which is talked about for the children. Because children are told to obey and because they are under their parents in rank. They are not equals in that sense. But in the marriage, the woman is an equal partner, okay? But she willingly and voluntarily places herself under the authority of her husband. We see this exemplified in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians that Jesus is God. He exists in the form of God. He was equal with God. But at the same time, we see that Jesus is submissive to the Father. In fact, he's actually quite open about this when he is here on earth, and he doesn't try to hide this fact in the least. In John 5.30, Jesus says this, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is God speaking, God in the flesh speaking, but he is talking about the Father. In John 8.28, he says, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. So again, Jesus is very, very clear that he is under the Father. Matthew 24, 36. But concerning, Jesus is speaking, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So, so Jesus is not saying, man, my father never tells me nothing. No, he's saying, I don't know this, but that, that's okay. I am under the authority of the father. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, we're talking about suffering and death. What did Jesus have say here when he was praying to the father? Do I have this on there? So Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before his suffering and death. We've gone through this several times. And going a little farther, he, farther, he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, we're talking about suffering and death. Jesus is equal to God, but he is submitting to the Father. You know, when my parents would tell me to do something or they would tell me not to do something, I would have to tell my friends, my parents won't let me do that. Or my parents are making me do that. I was submitting, but I wasn't submissive. But there's no sign of Jesus doing that. His submission it was both in attitude and in action. Now, why are wives told here to line up behind their husbands? 
Well, again, in verse 18, it says, as is fitting in the Lord. And the word for fitting has this idea of being proper, and it also has this idea of connection. So it connects to the Lord. It connects to our Lord Jesus. Okay, so, so this is God's idea. It's not a chauvinistic idea. It's not situational. It's not cultural. It's not political. It's, it's a universal type of thing. And why is it fitting? Well, one reason is because it reflects his essence and his nature of the Trinity. Again, remember in Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You know, I was always, why are there the the mix-up and the pronouns? You know, you got the him and the them, the the singular and the plural. Well, it's trying to express there's a unity in the plurality. There's a unity in the plurality. God is three persons, but one God. Three persons, one God. Father, Son, Son. Holy Spirit, one God. It's not Father, 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 not Son, Son, Son. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Okay? In the same way, marriage is two persons, husband and wife. Not husband, husband, not wife, wife, but husband, wife. Two persons, but we find out later that it's one flesh. So three persons, one God, two persons, one flesh. And that's reflecting of each other. Okay? And that's what we saw in Jesus Christ. Again, although he was equal with the Father because Jesus is God, He was submissive to the Father. And we see the Father and the Son sending the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, who is God, is submissive to the Father and to the Son. So there's a hierarchy in the the equality in the Godhead, a hierarchy in the equality which is to be reflected in marriage. And that's why this is fitting. Marriage illustrates and reflects the essence and nature of our triune God. Each partner reflects Part of that. And I know living this out can be hard, okay? I've been in authority, I've been under authority throughout my life, and living, being under authority can be difficult when you don't agree, okay? Uh, so I understand the struggle that you have. So wives, if you are married, you know, pray and ask God that he would give you and grow in you that submissive spirit towards the Lord and towards your husband. And then pray for your husbands that they would be submitted to God and walking with him. Because that's really what would make it so much easier for you to be submissive, is when you know that your husband is walking after God. For those of you who are single and hope to get married someday, ladies, what do you look for in a guy? Could be looks, could be personality, sense of humor. Those are all good and nice to have. But if you want to have a biblical marriage, now look for someone that you would be willing to line up behind. Okay? If he's good-looking, he has a great personality, he's funny, he makes you laugh, but he's directionless in life, he's lazy, and he plays video games all day, that's a disaster waiting to happen, okay? You're better off staying single, okay? So just, just saying, think, think that through before you take that step, okay? So wives are to line up voluntarily behind their husbands. Next, husbands are addressed in verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So they're commanded to love their wives. Now, back in those days, the husbands, they, they, they were like the dictator, okay, who the wife, and the wife was more like, actually more like a servant, more like a property back in those days, okay? So, so this is a major, major change for the way that husbands were to look at their wives or see their wives, okay? So here, Christian marriage is meant to be a partnership, a partnership. And husbands are to exercise loving leadership, not, not dictatorial domination, okay? And what is the love here? Uh, the love here, the, word, the Greek word is agape, okay? And I define this type of love as seeking God's best for the one love. Seeking God's best for the one love. Not what I think is best, not what she thinks is best, what God thinks is best for the one love, okay? So the second point for today is husbands are to seek God's best for their wives in an understanding way. Okay, so that doesn't just mean that you provide for her. It's much more than that, okay? Love listens. It it, it sees her needs and sees her fears and sees her concerns just as you would see your own needs, fears, and concerns. Love seeks to understand. Why does she feel this way? Why is she thinking this way? I might not understand, but I want to understand why does she see things this way. Love respects. It's her, her opinions, her feelings as worthy, 
even if they are at odds with his own, they are worthy of discussion. Love cares. Love seeks to meet her needs and her wants just as much as he wants to seek his own needs and his own desires and wants. Love shares, okay? She's a partner. She's not a subordinate. Let her know what's going on, okay? Don't, don't shut her out of what's going on in your life. See, this love that's talked about here is selfless, not selfish. It's not just a feeling, but it's a willingness to build a very strong relationship. It's never concerned with power or control. One writer says, the real test of my loving is not that I feel loving, but that the other person feels loved by me. That's the real test. Not how I feel or how I think, but how does she feel? What does she think? So those decisions back I was talking about when we were at an impasse, and Christine would say, okay, let me know what you decide. It isn't like, yeah, I get my way. <laughs> I love this verse. No, no. It was like God saying to me, I've entrusted her to you, and she's entrusting herself to you. You have to make a good decision. Don't mess this up. Okay, so there's a major sense of responsibility as she did this because I realize now that not only was I making a decision for myself, but I was making a decision for her too. I was responsible not just for myself, but for her and the family too. And so this was something very, very, very important for me to realize, okay? Because if I'm loving, I can't just think for myself. I have to weigh her desires, her needs, her fears, and her opinions just as equally as I weigh my own. And my decision, again, doesn't just affect me, it affects her, my family, so I'm responsible. I have to own this decision. And sometimes I would decide things her way because after careful consideration, I felt that was the best way to go for us. And if I did that, if it didn't go well, or if we found that it, my way was the better way, I didn't have the right to say, I told you so. Because in the end, I have to take responsibility for that decision. So you have to love them and re consider our wives and their thoughts and their opinions just as much as I would my own. And it says here in verse 19 as well, do not be harsh with them. Okay, so that deals with how you treat your spouse, your wife. Do you yell? Do you scream? Do you lose your temper? Do you intimidate? That's part of being harsh. But the other aspect of being harsh is to not be embittered against them, to not be embittered against them. That means having this irritable attitude because of the differences that you have. Now, 1 Peter 3, 7 tells us this. Likewise, husband, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And a weaker vessel doesn't mean that she's, she's lesser or that she's you know, emotionally or, or intellectually weaker. It's just basically physical. That basically, most husbands would beat their wives in an arm wrestle, okay, because they're stronger, okay? But that's what they're talking about here. Nothing about value or anything like that. Since they are heirs with you, okay? So there's an equality. They are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So live with your wives in an understanding way. And literally, in the original language, it says, live with your wives according to knowledge. In other words, you need to know and understand her. Know and understand her. you got to recognize that women are different. They're wired differently, and they think differently. Okay? In computer terms, okay, they got different hardware and software. Okay? They have a whole different operating system. All right? And, and, and that's okay. That's a, that's a good thing. Okay? Because God made them that way. It's to complement you, not to compete against you. So, so be like a Mac computer, a Mac Apple computer. They're able to read and understand PC files, okay? Uh, think that way, okay? Because a lot of times, because they're different, all right, it's easy for men to get frustrated, to get angry. Why don't you see things my way? But instead, we're told to appreciate those differences. Appreciate this. Strive to be patient. Seek to work things out together. Instead of hardening your heart, soften it. Because that's what a loving husband should do. It says that Jesus, in Hebrews, he's a high priest who understands, who sympathizes with our weaknesses. Even though he was without sin, he was tempted the same way we are. He knows what we're going through. He understands us. 
And guys, we need to model that with our spouses or our future wives, to sympathize, to understand why they think the way they do. And this love and submission, it's a responsive thing, okay? The more loving a husband is towards his wife, I think it's a lot easier for her to line up behind him, okay? In my opinion, okay, you know, the feminist movement really wasn't a result of women who wanted control. It was because husbands were failing at their role to love and to treat women as equal partners in the marriage. So it's more of a failure of the men than a rebellion of the woman. In fact, there's a, a British psychologist who, I guess American men received a stinging insult from this British psychologist. He described these guys as, American men, as a bunch of weak-kneed, lily-livered sissies. Now, he had done a previous survey, and in that previous survey, he had judged women to be at fault and declared woman, American women to be domineering. And he explained how he changed his viewpoint. He says, he says, before I thought that woman wanted to rule the country, I changed that opinion. Women are compelled to take over, not fighting to take over. I thought the men who attended with their wives some seminars I spoke at would shoot me for my remarks, but instead they all agreed with me. It's still the fatherless society. The husbands are not husbands. All the women are crying out for a strong man, and he's, not, he's just not there. It's really hard to line up behind someone who isn't loving, who isn't really looking out for you. All right, so husbands, this has to start with you. Just like our relationship with Christ. Christ initiated his relationship with us by loving us, by dying for us, giving up his life and making sacrifices for us to show his love for us. And so we respond to that by willingly receiving him and lining up behind him and giving our lives to him. So in the same way, husbands need to initiate by being that loving husband who cares and sacrifices for his wife so that your wife, in response, would willingly line up behind you because she knows that you have her back. So husbands and future husbands, you can help your wives or your future wives in following their command to be lining up behind you by being a person who is submittable. If they are be, to be submissive to you, then you need to be a person who is submittable, okay? A leader who is following after God, a leader a woman would want to follow, okay? So maybe cut down on the hours of video games and studying meaningless sports statistics, and maybe spend some of that time instead in the Word of God, developing your relationship with God, your life vision, your character, and your direction. Don't commit the sin of cursing your family or future family with an unspiritual, biblically ignorant fool for a dad or a husband. Your family deserves better. And if that's where you are now, don't be discouraged. Because God is in the transformation business. I've seen it happen time and time again for people who were directionless, and not really sure how to run their marriage or things like that, where God was able to get a hold of them and change them. And so don't be discouraged, but be inspired to be the husband or the future husband that God wants you to be. Aspire to godliness and let him work on you. Cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he works. Now, after a, a sermon like this, I could see this kind of happening in our homes this evening. I could see husbands telling their wives, you're not very submissive. I could see husbands kind of nudging their wives even as I speak. Or wives telling their husbands, you're not very loving. And I could see maybe some wives are nudging their husbands even as I speak. But notice, it doesn't say, husbands, make your wives submissive. And it doesn't say, wives, make your husbands loving. So in other words, husbands, make sure you're focusing not on what your wife is doing, but focus I'm making sure you are loving your wife as Christ loved the church, as it says in Ephesians. And wives, focus not on what your husband is doing, but are you doing your best to line up behind him? In other words, make sure you're minding your own business, okay? Uh, and, and everyone is doing their part. You'll see how the peace of Christ rules in the home. And when someone in the marriage isn't doing their part, 
Well, you keep doing your part because the command isn't conditional. It doesn't say, wives, submit to your husbands if they are loving. It doesn't say, husbands, love your wives if they are submissive. In fact, in 1 Peter, it says that wives should be following or lining up behind their husbands, even if they're not a Christian, so that by your behavior, they may be one without a word. That's why it's better to marry a Christian, by the way, okay? So even if you are not to make your spouse obey these commands, you have to look at how you are doing in terms of obeying this command through their eyes in order to see how well you are doing in terms of living out this command. So wives, don't ask, am I submissive or am I lining up behind my husband? Maybe ask, does my husband think I'm lining up behind him? And husbands, don't ask, do I love my wife? But ask, does my wife think that I love her? And if you're really brave, humbly ask your spouse tonight or this week what they think about how you're doing in the role that God has given you. And even though you are not to make your spouse obey this command, again, look at it through their eyes. Now, you might be saying, Pastor Barry, you don't know my husband. Or, you know, you, you don't know, he's not worthy of my submission. Or you might say, you know, you don't know my wife. You know, she, she is so unlovable. <laughs> Again, there's no conditions that are mentioned here. Unless the authority is telling you to sin, in that case, God's authority trumps their authority. But unless that's the case, we need to obey God's word in this unconditionally. And maybe God has placed you in the situation that you're in to teach you more about himself about unconditional love, about unconditional submission. Because these are all characteristics that we see in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And remember what I said earlier, peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of Christ. The presence of Christ. And remember the context. It's the peace of Christ with the word of Christ in the name of Christ. So keep Christ as the center of your marriage. Read the Bible together or pray together. Make Christ the center because marriage was meant to reflect him and to reflect his character. And I hope that we can all aspire to have the marriage that God has designed because not only does it bring about peace in the home, but it reflects so much about God and his character. And I know these commands are not easy to follow. Our sin nature often rears its ugly head, especially at home, when we often let our guard down. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need to yield to him and allow him to make us what he wants us to be so that we can make our marriages or our future marriages what it was meant to be, a reflection of God's essence and nature within the Trinity and his love and his understanding of us. Because these days, folks, the world needs a better picture of God and Christ's love for us. Let's let them see it through our marriages, our future marriages. And let the peace of Christ rule in our marriages with these rules for our marriages. Okay, let's bow for a minute. And what is God saying to you this morning as we think about what God has designed in marriage? If you are married, how are you doing in living these out? If you're not married, but you hope to be someday, would this be what you see as the model for marriage? And maybe some of you are single, maybe you don't intend to get married in the future, and that's fine. That's a, a good option according to Paul. But maybe God is using you to encourage those friends of yours who are married or those friends of you who want to be married to encourage them to see marriage the way God sees it. So what is God saying to you this morning? Just spend a few moments with the Lord and asking him to speak to you and to reveal to you what you need to take from this.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for each and every one of us that was shown through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for creating marriage, Lord God, a wonderful reflection of your character, your nature. It is meant to be a picture for us to see more about you, how you've designed life to be. Lord, forgive us if we have taken the world's view of marriage and just seen it all as about romance and feelings, forgetting, Lord, that that's a very sacred, very important, meant to be a Christ-centered relationship. So to help us that as we, those of us who are married, that we would really strive to fulfill the roles that you have given us. For those of us who aren't married, Lord, that hope to be married someday, that this would be the model of what we want our future marriages to be. And Lord, if we don't plan to get married or are single, Lord, I pray that we would be able to be encouraging our married friends or friends who are hoping to get married to point them to you. Because, Lord, this reflects so much about you. It is meant to be a picture to those around us and to the world of your love for us and your essence and nature. So help us to be faithful witnesses of you and to live these out in our lives. This is Jesus' awesome name.